All Saints Lutheran Church is a ministry of word and sacrament. We believe, teach, and confess that Jesus Christ descends to us and is truly present with us and for us in the divine service where he delivers his good gifts to us through the tangible, physical means of word and water, bread and wine. Communion with God involves our whole selves, including our bodies, in participation with one another and our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not meant to happen inside our heads, isolated in front of a computer screen. We are glad to offer you these video recordings and online resources to enable you to hear the word, but this can never be a replacement or substitute for the in-person divine service. While extenuating circumstances may justify temporary separation, we look forward to the day when we can receive Christ's gifts together in the divine service.
Good morning. Our gospel reading today reveals Jesus as our Lord who has compassion on us, uh, who has compassion on us as we languish in our sins, in all of the suffering uh, and trial that a life in this sinful world brings upon us. Uh, but he doesn't just have compassion on us in a sense of sort of shared feeling or, or something like that, but he has compassion that motivates him to take action. He's the one who did something about our sin and our misery. He's the one who went to the cross for us and rose again victorious so that we might know that even when, when death finally claims us, we shall be raised just as he is raised. And that risen Lord is here with us today with his gifts of life and salvation. And for that, we rejoice. A couple of uh, announcements. Just a reminder that we have a voters assembly meeting on October 1st. Please read carefully the announcement in the back of the bulletin that will tell you all about all the things that we'll be covering in that Voters' Assembly meeting. A good and important work that needs to be done by the voting members of our congregation. So please plan on attending that uh, so we can carry out some of that work of the church. Uh, also, there's an Oktoberfest planning meeting on Tuesday, September 26th. Um, uh, for those of you who are interested in helping out with the planning of Oktoberfest, uh, we will be ha hosting an LWML Zone Rally here on Saturday, September the 30th, and I have the uh, blessing and privilege of serving as lit liturgist and catechist for that event. So invite all the ladies of the church to come out for our LWML Zone Rally on that Saturday. Uh, don't forget the uh, Youth Penny Wars fundraiser. Um, that helps to uh, raise funds for the youth to do uh, uh, fun things, and, but even especially uh, attend Higher Things conferences and so forth. Uh, and don't forget, uh, and I'm, I'm counting on you guys, make sure you guys give a lot of the money there so that the ladies have to cook up for us breakfast rather than us having to cook the ladies breakfast, all right? Counting on you guys, all right. <clears throat> well, that's it for our announcements then. Uh, let us rise for prayer. Heavenly Father, we rejoice that you gather us together here in this place where our compassionate Lord comes to serve us with gifts of life and salvation. In the midst of our sins, in the midst of the sufferings and tribulations and trials of this life, we pray that these gifts of our Lord Jesus Christ would comfort us and strengthen us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love for me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Be gracious to me, O Lord. For to you do I cry all the day. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you.
The Old Testament reading for the 16th Sunday after Trinity is from 1 Kings chapter 17. After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill. And his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to bring to my sin, bring my sin to remembrance, and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, Give me your son. And she took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged, and laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, you have brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son. Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. According to St. Luke, the seventh chapter. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. As he drew near to the gate of the town, behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. And he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, 
A great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the God that is Father before all worlds, God of God, life of life. 
name of Jesus. Amen. See the bold and daring confidence of St. Paul writing to the church in Ephesus from a jail cell. If anyone had an occasion for fear, trembling, or dismay, it would be St. Paul. As you know, the Emperor Nero didn't mess around with Christians. Paul must have known the likelihood that his end was near and that a jail cell would be his last earthly home. But he is not moved. His faith is not shattered. He doesn't spend his time wallowing in self-pity. He spends it preaching the gospel to his captors and writing letters to the churches. Would you be so confident in his situation? The world finds its confidence and strength in fame and fortune, success and praise, health and well-being. The world sees these things as the ultimate good, as the only things worth striving for. They fall easily into despair when their earthly security is threatened or lost. The world cannot understand faith like St. Paul's. Paul's not the only one. He finds himself in very good company. Cross and trial, suffering and grief has, have always, and I mean always, been part and parcel of the Christian life. Even the Old Testament faithful knew this as the writer to the Hebrews recalls in chapter 11. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 11 details his own suffering, writing of his far greater labors, far more imprisonments with countless beatings and often near death. Five times I received at the hand of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers. If there was anybody who could have his middle name be Danger, it'd be St. <laughs> Paul. In toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And then there are our Old Testament and Gospel readings for today where we see even more suffering. Two faithful women who have experienced great tragedy. Two women who lost not only their husbands but also their only sons. And with their deaths also their security and their livelihood. Condemned to a life of poverty with little hope for a bright future. And then there's you and I. We have our sufferings as well. Those great losses, those crosses and trials, those sufferings and grief. We've lost loved ones. Some of us, like the widows in our reading, have lost spouses or children. We've known sickness and injury. We've lived with handicaps and mental disorders. We've been abused and abandoned, we've been slandered and betrayed, we've been robbed and cheated, we've known the sting of betrayal, the severing of friendships, the pain of divorce. We have failed where we hoped to succeed and we're plagued often by the memory of our sins and the regrets of the past. And if these things weren't enough, we witness every night on the evening news, the latest atrocities and catastrophes from every part of the world. 
wars and rumors of wars, genocides, murders, thefts, natural disasters, and man-made disasters. It's enough to make anyone question God. Is this what faith gets us? Is this the reward for following Christ? It appears so. Jesus himself told his disciples, in the world you will have tribulation. He also said, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. And a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. So, dear Christians, this is what you get for your faith in this life. Trials, cross, sufferings. Forget what the Rick Warrens and Joel Osteens and Stephen Furtick's tell you. They're wrong. Far from promising the easy life, Jesus clearly reveals the life of faith will involve suffering, even severe suffering. A servant is not greater than his master. If Jesus, the only perfect man who ever lived, suffered, why should you expect to have it better than him? Now that's hard to swallow, isn't it? And we react to this in different ways. Some get angry and they curse God and deny his existence. Others just become stoic and they grit their teeth and they try to endure what they cannot explain. Some blame themselves, believing that God is punishing them for their sins. But perhaps the one most common to us is doubt. Deep down, we doubt whether God is really as good as we've been told he is. Maybe he can't be trusted. He's got his plans and he's going to do what he wants. And maybe for God, the ends justify the means. Maybe for God, there are acceptable losses. But we see in our gospel reading today how Jesus wages war against suffering and death. His attitude toward suffering and death are anything but nonchalant. He's deeply moved by the suffering of the widow by the dead boy being carried to the tombs. That Greek word, splachna, indicates a gut-wrenching compassion, an anguish that comes from deep within, the anguish that brought forth tears, for example, at the death of Lazarus. And so this is important for us to understand that if you are disturbed by suffering and death, know that Jesus is aggrieved. If you are sorrowful, Jesus is sorrowful even unto death. If you are angry, Jesus is furious. Whatever you feel, in the face of suffering and death, Jesus feels it more deeply than you could ever know or imagine. We were created by God to be the objects of His love. And so Jesus is grieved by what our sins have done to us. And that's an important thing for us to understand. We must confess this. God is not responsible for suffering in this world. He is not the author of evil, of pain, of sin. We are, along with the devil who tempted us. We, the human race, bear the responsibility for all the suffering and evil in this world. And Jesus is grieved by this. He's like a father who sees his son in great suffering. I've been there. And maybe you've been there too. 
There are times when I would have given anything to take my son's place in that hospital bed or in that operating room. But sadly, I could not. I did not have the power. I could only stand by helpless, trusting in God. And you've been there too. You know the feeling of helplessness in the face of suffering, whether it's your own suffering or the suffering of someone you love. And there's no way to avoid that. But know this, Jesus is not helpless. He feels our suffering deeply. He is sorrowful even unto death. In our gospel, he is deeply moved to action. He raises the boy. He returns him to his mother. Jesus at that moment wages war against death and in that instance for a little while, death lost. I say for a little while because death would eventually claim this boy again and his mother and all the mourners whose sadness was turned to joy that day would soon mourn again. So it's important for us to understand that the raising of the widow's son was not the end of the story. And it wasn't the final victory for Jesus. As spectacular as that healing was, it was just the preview of what was to come. The final victory would involve Jesus going to the cross to give his life for the life of the world. There he would suffer in your place so that you would have an end to your suffering. He was rejected by the Father in your place so that you might be accepted by the Father in His grace. He died in your place so that your death will not be your end. And He rose as the first fruits of the dead, assuring you that you will rise to eternal victory. That is our hope and joy. Not the false hopes of the popular preachers of some superficial bliss in this life of earthly health or earthly wealth or earthly success. Apostle Paul destroys that notion in 1 Corinthians 15. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. No, our hope is is in the promises of Christ in His Word, in what He has done for us and won for us, in the certainty of His victory over death and the promise of the life to come. And our joy is in the foretastes of the feast to come, which we partake of here and now. Our joy is in the forgiveness of sins received now in holy baptism and in the absolution, and in the supper. For where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. So, Paul, in our epistle, pleads with the Ephesians, I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is for your glory. As he suffers, his only concern is for the faith of his flock. Paul's firm faith in the face of death is not by his own strength. Relying on himself, he could never have had such confidence. And our confidence, too, fails when we look to ourselves for strength. But Paul drew strength from his baptism. He was led by the Holy Spirit working through the Word. He was rooted and grounded in the incomprehensible love of Christ, demonstrated in His suffering and death and resurrection. So when we find ourselves timid or fearful or worried, when the trials of life threaten to paralyze our love for God and for others, we draw strength from the same well as St. Paul. What we need in those moments is more Word, more Christ, more sacrament, 
more absolution, more gospel. And that our Lord provides for us abundantly. In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? The Lord is on my side, I will not fear. What can man do to me? The one who gave his life for you on the cross. The one who washes you, washed you clean in baptism. The one who feeds you with his own body and blood. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. The Lord God is your strength and your shield. And he has become your salvation. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, Father of all, we bow before you in all confidence and beg you, 
Strengthen us by your Spirit. Ground us in your love. And fill up what we lack out of your own abundance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O great physician, you lend your own power to the works of mercy done in the name of your Son, that they may increase faith in the words your servants speak. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Faithful Father, when loss and heartache invade our homes and tempt us to devout your to doubt your divine care, hear our cries and renew our faith and life in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of life and death, you have given all things into the hands of your Son. Inspire those who bear the sword in his stead to do so in faithfulness and love for their fellow man. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Lord, you lead us as St. Paul before us through many tribulations to know the fullness of your love. Strengthen the family and friends of Larry who mourn. Also, Rachel and her little one, John, Crystal, Arlene, Ken, Brian, Walter, Alan, Stetson, Ralph, Cheryl, Juanita, Eric, David, Rhonda, Betty, Alvina, Larry, Cherry, Abby, Brent, a student of Amy, Fanny, Sue, Dale, Chrissy, Thomas, James, Ruby, Sarah, Jim, Christina, and Alicia, and all who suffer, that they may praise you for your faithfulness, Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Lord of the harvest, grant that in true faith we may worthily go to your altar to receive the very body and true blood that your Son has given for our redemption. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of hosts, your saints in heaven now know as they are known and comprehend the fullness of your love in Christ. Conduct our way through this fallen world to join them in your heavenly presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever. Amen. <clears throat>
Depart in peace, sins forgiven.